uh, amazing trainers we have had in JCI India. Uh, my national president, when I was the uh, loan president in 2003, the Skill Development Committee Chairman, uh, uh, Advocate Raman Kumarji, uh, the head of our family, uh, somebody who I respect a lot, not just because of his position, but because of what he has contributed. I just see his wonderful smile there, uh, you know, uh, right on my screen on, in, in the frame. Uh, Ravi Shankarji, thank you so much for blessing us. Uh, past national president, uh, Ramesh Ji, somebody I look uh, up to and look forward to meeting each time, uh, you know, through his uh, amazing qualities that we have learned. Uh, Raman Ji, uh, a lot of uh, our, our colleagues, uh, my seniors here, uh, so many of them past presidents, uh, past national presidents of JCI India. It's been an absolute uh, honor, a great delight to be amongst the uh, you know, such a, such a wonderful gathering. Uh, here comes the bang and what's the bang all about and uh, how are we going to get from uh, cool to awesome because that's what has been communicated. I said, well, uh, the bang is nothing. It's just a state of uh, release of energy. When the big bang happened from a single atom, all of us, the entire universe got created. But when a bang happens, the uh, balloon bursts, well, the state changes and the state changes permanently. This is what exactly I thought I'd like to share with each of you, uh, you know, this evening. Uh, some of my experiences, some of the things that I have learned in my uh, uh, 22 years uh, as a career training and learning and development uh, person. I'd like to uh, also uh, share that, you know, when bang happens, not every time, uh, you know, the release of energy is for the good. At times, uh, things can be a bit uh, on the other side as well. What I'll be sharing with you today are some of my most personal experiences. Some of my experiences in learning with people across the world. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, being a global traveler. So some of the experiences that I have collated, I'd like to share with each of you. Uh, right up in the beginning, uh, you know, if you can put up on the chat box, uh, do you know which place on earth has got people who live the longest? The place which doesn't uh, see any prevalence of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or they don't even have mental issues. And for that reason, they do not have, uh, you know, a people who are psychologists or psychiatrists trying to, you know, uh, deconstruct a few theories there. I get answers. A lot of you are mentioning uh, Japan and this place, though uh, uh, one of the uh, best places around uh, is also a place which doesn't have access to modern medicine. Yes, folks, a lot of you are absolutely right. It is Japan. But uh, care to be a little more specific? Where in Japan? Somebody's you know, mentioned Bhutan, Sweden. Okay. Ah, absolutely. Ajit Kumar. Ajit Kumar, the trainer, mentions uh, it is Okinawa. Yes, folks, it is Okinawa. And this is Japan. One of the most uh, beautiful places, a place which is remote a place which is far away from any uh, influences of uh, modern mindset. It doesn't mean that they don't have modern ways of life. They don't have uh, the regular uh, means to live a good life. They have that, but the mindset is absolutely different. In that place, people live with a specific theory. They have a specific value system. This value system has, you know, led them to where they are today. Uh, and this value system continues to be a part of their lifestyle for almost 2000 years now. It's a process. It's, it's, it's a protocol. It's a SOP, we might say, a standard operating procedure, which they live by. And this protocol is given a very beautiful name. Can somebody make this out? What is this? Well, it is pronounced as Ikigai. Ikigai. Ikigai is what it is. And Ikigai 
in, in very simple language, in very simple terms, Ikigai means a reason for being, a reason or a purpose, something that gets you up in the morning tomorrow, something that you look forward to coming tomorrow. That is Ikigai. Made of two words, uh, ki, as we all know, is life. So iki is life or staying alive. And kai, from which the guy happens, the result, the reason, the purpose. Iki guy is the purpose of life, a reason for being. So in Okinawa, these people, they've, they've come out with something which says, if we do not have anything to look forward to tomorrow, why live? And when we do not have a purpose to look forward to tomorrow, well, a lot of things are going to be lost. Specifically, stresses are going to invade. And that's when all these modern day illnesses, the lifestyle challenges, they keep coming in. They give us four questions to live by. They say, start with these four questions. What are these four questions? One, what do you love? What do you love doing? Uh, Okay, uh, somebody said I'm not visible. Well, folks, uh, I'm having some challenges with my uh, you know, uh, connectivity here. So possibly uh, it'll keep going and coming back, but uh, I guess the voice is clear. So the question number one, it says, what do you love? Question number two, you got to answer, and that is, what are you good at? And when we answer what are we good at, it means we love doing something and we are absolutely the best doing that something the third question that needs an answering is what does the world need from you or if you would like to take it the other way what would you like to contribute to the world but then they top it off with the final question what would be your reward because if there is no payoff people would not keep doing it what would be your reward i'd like to share a smallish video with you possibly uh, that will help you understand the entire theory and then why why do I say that you know uh, the guy needs to be followed while we go from you know being cool to being awesome here's the video check it out So I'm, I'm, you know, told by people you can't get the audio well. Uh, the audio seems to be okay here, but then there's a bandwidth issue. Uh, and for that reason, uh, you know, we we put the uh, subtext here in the video, so that'll help you uh, quite a bit understand. That.
And that's a very important question that needs answering. What do you wake up for? And once we have that answer, it is going to be, uh, you know, the transition from cool to awesome, being legendary, being iconic. That That is not, uh, you know, far away. Uh, let me ask you a few things, a few questions. Uh, tell me, uh, you know, if these were to be served on the platter to you, what would you choose? Uh, getting married to an utterly simple, non-competitive person and being forced by situations to relocate to a new city, getting into a new city, new state, no knowledge of the local language, not even having a home, got to search for a house and not even having a stable source of income. Or living through very difficult financial and emotional struggles on a regular basis. Struggles so difficult, so challenging that it would be enough for you to be driven to depression and suicide. Or an open heart surgery. Maybe a painful fracture. Loss of your mom at a very early age when she is needed the most. Birth of a child with severe deformity. Multiple heart troubles. Severe rheumatic pains. Losing a child. Painful. And if you're a lady, painful and complicated delivery. Forced to do a C-section at the last minute to save lives. Suffering a heart attack. What would you choose? What would you choose? So, from amongst all these, I guess most of these people who are, who are you know, listening possibly would, would compromise for, if at all you've got to choose, you might want to compromise for one or somebody would want to go with a four. So either getting married to a simpleton or maybe a fracture if you've got to choose between these 11, what would you choose? So, you know, a very nice, beautiful platter, 11 things, all very deadly. What are you going to choose? Let me introduce you to somebody. This somebody is not just somebody. It's, a, it's, it's, it's about a person that I'm trying to share with you. Somebody who's very close to me, my family, is almost, uh, you know, a part of our family. And we, 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 we love this person a lot. That's the lady I'm trying to, you know, share a story with you. Her name's Rocky, Neha post-marriage. That's her husband, Hemant. Very simple guy, a very simple bloke from Rajkot. Rocky had been a part of my team when I was working in my first job. I had recruited Rocky, you know, uh, and that was those days, it was just a telephone call. She was working with a company called Panwaya. Uh, and she was a paging executive. She used to make calls. And the voice was so uh, brilliant on the other side. I thought I must have this person. And this is, I'm you know, talking of 1996. I thought this is the person I'd like to have in my team. So I recruited her. And uh, she became part of my team. She became part of my enterprise. And everything that we used to do, Rocky was around because of her absolutely amazing persona. Rocky got married. And before she got married, she had an open heart surgery. So those 11 things that I was talking to you about, uh, all those 11 things happened with that one single person. Getting married to an utterly simple person, being, you know, off-rooted from his city, that is Rajkot, from her city, that is Baroda, and circumstances became so challenging, they had to go all the way to Bangalore. Being in a city without a job, being in a city without a home, being in a city without even knowing Kannad. And then they start their life. These two Sindhi, uh, you know, uh, this, this beautiful Sindhi couple started their life. Rahi already had an open heart surgery before she got married. She gets married, gets off-rooted, goes to Bangalore, loses her mom. Her father has a hip surgery, a hip replacement surgery. All these things kept on happening. Well, God blessed her. Twins happened to her. Two beautiful daughters. You can see the pictures. Yes, I say beautiful daughters. Her pregnancy was one of the most difficult pregnancies because they were trying for everything. Nothing happened at the last minute to save three lives because she had twins. A C-section had to be organized. And what they saw, uh, it, it, it was hidden in the sonography. 
it was not very clear why scans were being made across the three trimesters. What they saw were not two normal babies, one normal baby, other baby, like you see in the picture. That's who was the other baby. Just a couple of months, uh, you know, after her birth, that's the size of her head. Now, Rocky is always a person who is very stoic. You, you call her up uh, in whatever state she would be, she'd always say, if, if I were to ask her a question, Rocky, how are you? How is your day going on? And Rocky would say, it's brilliant. I'm having a great day. What about you? She would never say, I'm having a tough time. Rocky, two daughters, one with this condition, continues with her life, continues trudging forward. They get a job, take a home on rent. They live their life, of course, not without tragedy striking once again, they lose one of their child, one of the children, the daughter with a uh, you know, congenital disorder, she passes away. Her name's Tanya. Tanya was no more. I was attending a NatCon in Puducherry when I got the call from Rakhi and she said, uh, you know, you're one of the closest people in our family, to our family, and I'd like to share something with you I said, what? She said, well, God took our pretty fairy. I couldn't really attend my, uh, you know, I was a national officer then in the making and then I couldn't really uh, attend this uh, beautiful national convention so very well. And then Rocky continued moving forward. Painful fractures, uh, multiple heart troubles. Very recently, she had a heart attack. All through this, Rahi has been very, very consistent. Consistent with one thing, and that is she's never, never looked left, looked right. She's always looked forward. And if you ask, how are you doing? She says, Baba is there to take care of me. Baba is saying Baba to her. She always says, well, when Baba is around, I've got nothing to worry. Rahi teaches us something. You got something to look forward to tomorrow. You got a purpose to live. You got questions to answer all those four questions mentioned by, uh, you know, the, the followers of the uh, Ikigai, Ikigai principle in Okinawa. She has an answer for everything. She says, I have something to look forward to tomorrow. And that is giving the people in my family, giving the people, the boys and girls. She teaches a lot of uh, children in uh, a small locality in uh, Bangalore where she lives. She teaches them. And she says, I've got something to offer to them. I look forward to tomorrow. And each time, today also I called her, I said, uh, you know, I'm going to need your permission to share your life story. She says, uh, well, it's not my life story, it's, it's life story for everyone I love a lot. So, Rocky, that was then. This is Rocky with, you know, her daughter and the other daughter as well. And that's Rocky today. You can see how brilliant this, this beautiful, lady is looking lo looking looking at her face you can understand the the beauty radiating through her face absolutely amazing it's just like a safe in your room when you talk to her you 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 might go into a very uh, you know a different mood altogether down and out and broken rocky a call to rocky can absolutely back to life that is what the key guy is you want to be you're awesome. You want to make a bang. You want to make things happen. They're not going to happen overnight. You got to, you know, there's something called the muscle memory. The mind has a memory. The brain has a memory. You got to train yourself. Uh, not everybody can be trained. Well, Rocky is not somebody who needed training. And this is where I believe a lot of things keep happening. Uh, today morning, I got a call from uh, our other colleague uh, in, the, in this uh, beautiful panel. And that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the coach in Harish. Kochin Harish, as the new name has now been, uh, you know, uh, assigned to him. Kochin Harish calls me and says, uh, and it, it was a talk trying to, uh, you know, wish me luck for today's uh, talk. And Harish says, uh, you know, sir, uh, you came to Kochin a couple of years back and you gave us uh, a specific uh, learning. And he mentioned that. I'm trying to share the same thing with you. Normally, I would not want to share something that I've already done in the past. This is something which Harish reminded me of. And uh, they, they corroborate to the three steps uh, in Ikigai. And these three steps that I'm presenting to you 
are the steps that I've learned from somebody. I'm not able at a liberty right now uh, to name that person because we are on a you know, national platform. I got into conversation with somebody who is an absolute uh, a global giant, one of the uh, uh, creators of the world's, uh, some of the world's largest, uh, you know, startups. The company uh, is a, a client of mine and an interaction happened. I sent a mail, I got a reply. The mail was, can you share with me the three steps or a few steps to uh, succeed in life? He sent me a mail. He says, well, I don't know secrets, but then I'll share with you steps that I uh, took to succeed in life. And uh, the mail happened, uh, he says, uh, you know, three steps, sure, I'd like to share with you, but please be warned, these steps are those which people across the world might be aware of. Almost everybody, he, he gave a small number, he said 99.8% people in the world would be aware of these three steps, but, and the sentence was incomplete, I had to scroll down the mail to actually, uh, you know, go to the completion. So the first step came up, and step one, when he says, well, step one is something that, you really, really need to be aware of, and that is, you need to know where are you headed? You gotta know where you want to go. And this is what the people in Okinawa do. They know what they want, know where you want to go. Well, that was okay, cool. You know, we are JC trainers, we talk about goal setting, and uh, it didn't cut much ice with me. I thought, let me go to step number two, and step number two, uh, after step number one was step number two, and step number two said, know the, uh, you know, price you'll have to pay to reach where you want to go. Know the price you'll have to pay to reach where you want to go. And this, again, did not really excite me much. I thought, well, let me go to step number three and wind it up. Before step number three happened, the sentence that was incomplete, 99.8% of people in the world would know of these three steps. But here the sentence was being completed. The sentence completed, and I share with you, the sentence was, but only 0.2% of people in the world follow step number three. Only 0.2% of people in the world follow step number three. And he presented a small statistic, data that I had never seen, data that I had never read, uh, data that I had never heard from anyone. The statistic was very, very stunning. He said, only 0.2% of people in the world follow step number three. And that is the reason these 0.2% of people in the world control almost 90% of the world's economy. Absolutely profound knowledge. Something that I had never even, you know, in my wildest imagination, I could have guessed that the 0.2% people in the world control 90% of the global economy. And why? The why was because they follow step number three. What would be step number three? It was very simple. Three short words of English. He said, these people, the 0.2% of people who follow step number three, the ones who control the global economy, they simply pay the price. Now that was, uh, at that time when I read this, it, it seemed to be very dumb to me. I, I thought, well, what is this? Three steps, one of the biggest, uh, you know, giants uh, in the world, one of the largest creators of a successful uh, enterprise, people who are billionaires in your company work for you and you share these three things. But the last step, pay the price that got me thinking, that got me to, to, to do a rethink. And then I realized, am I really paying the price to be iconic? Am I really paying the price to reach where I want to reach? Do I really know what I want tomorrow? If I know that, am I willing to sacrifice what I have today to achieve what I want tomorrow? And this is where we all need to really get into when we want to be legendary, awesome, or iconic. I'd like to share with you pictures of somebody. Uh, you can tell me these pictures. Uh, some of my friends from, uh, you know, Kaylee or Calicut would know. Uh, can you tell me which state is being represented here? Which state is being represented? Which Indian state is being represented here? Okay. So... The, the, the chat box is alive and all answers are right. Absolutely bang on. Absolutely bang on. Which state? It is indeed Kerala. And uh, well, if it is Kerala, why would I want to, uh, you know, 
just 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 because I'm at home and uh, in isolation in a lockdown, married to a Malayali, is that the reason I'm putting Kerala or, or trying to represent something from Kerala with you? Well, no, that's not the point. Uh, the pictures I showed you, the pictures that you see on your screen right now, they are from one of the most amazing people I've never uh, I've ever known in my life. She was my former class teacher. The pictures are from Baroda and not from Kerala. This is Gujarat, this is Baroda, this is my city. And these pictures are from the time when recently she retired. While she was retiring, the entire school got converted to a mini Kerala. Was she so influential uh, uh, as a trustee? Was she so influential as a headmistress? Well, no, because she was not a trustee. She was not the headmistress. She never was even a principal then why so much of love? Why so much of uh, magnificence across the school? And these pictures that I just shared with you, these pictures have been doing the rounds across the internet zillions of times. My batchmates, my classmates, my colleagues, we have been seeing these pictures right from the time she retired. She's one person who's always known where she needed to go. She's one person who knows what does it take to really deliver. And over the past 30 years that she had been a teacher, she kept on delivering. And I'll tell you how. Some time back I met her while she was still in school. I was delivering a keynote speech to a group of educationists of Gujarat. And all the senior teachers and trustees were invited. 10 minutes into my speech, I saw a, a lady, short one, uh, come and take seat in the uh, auditorium. And I recognized she was my teacher before 1989 when I left school. And uh, I went down, I, I paused my talk, I went down, bent down, touched her feet to take her blessings and came back. We connected for a very brief moment and I came back and uh, I apologized to her on the mic. I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, uh, you know, uh, you might have been taken aback, but then uh, I, I, I know you would not have recognized me. And she stood up and she says, well, uh, young man, I know you very well. In my class, your name in my register was Himadri, but all of us friends used to call you Hemu. That's what legendary is. That's what iconic is. That's what people do when they really go from being cool to being awesome. Once that state of mind, that state of being is altered, you stay there for the rest of your lives. It's not like being, you know, stretching an elastic or a rubber band. It'll come back. When you have a sense of purpose, when you know your ikigai, you are going to keep coming back. And this is what Smita Dinesh, he taught me. Folks, uh, you might have heard of a place in uh, Greece, 6th and 4th centuries BC. This was very, very popular, a place called Sparta. And uh, some of you might have also uh, seen a movie or two uh, based on the uh, life of Spartans, uh, these are the people, uh, you know, who were the uh, citizens of Sparta. Now, Spartans were all about two things. One, you know, they would give you citizenship only if you are a mother who has lost her life. So posthumously, you would be given citizenship or if you are a soldier. That's what Spartans used to give, you know, uh, importance to. If you're a mother and while childbirth, you lose your life, you would be given citizenship of Sparta. Or if you're a soldier, you would be given citizenship of Sparta. All others were not there. They were not part of the state. So why Sparta? Why Sparta now? Why Sparta when we talk of something so important as going from being cool to being awesome? This is uh, uh, you know, a depiction of a Spartan uh, uh, soldier. They were very, very bare when they used to be dressed. So a bit of a chest plate, not visible here. Uh, they had a spear, a helmet, and the most profound thing that each Spartan soldier used to have was their shield. You know, in Sparta, what used to happen generally? These people, uh, they used to fight and they were the most ferocious uh, soldiers. When they used to fight, things really, really were very difficult for the enemy. They used to fight in small groups, never over 150 people 
or at the max they used to have two companies of 150 each and that is all 300 people and they should defeat all their enemies and that was the spartan history they used to be in a formation like this the shield used to cover two-thirds of their body they used to be moving forward and it was a virtual impenetrable wall you could never penetrate a spartan wall they would forgive people they would forgive people for losing their spear they would not forgive people for losing their shield i repeat in a spartan war people would be forgiven if they lose their spear but they would not be forgiven it would be known as desertion you've left your army they would not be forgiven if the shield is lost why because if you lose the shield you are opening up your team you're opening up your company you're opening up your group of people to enemy attack. Spartans always used to do one thing, and they used to do one thing very, very well. These are the shields called the hoplons. They used to do one thing very well, and that was protect their own. Protect their own, come what may. If you lose a spear and you die, what would happen? Somebody else will take your space. Somebody else will come and replace you. A hoplon is what used to protect them. I used to, uh, in, in my earlier days, I was uh, trained to be a mountaineer at the Swami Vivekananda Institute of Mountaineering, the only beacon of mountaineering uh, in India, and this was in uh, Mount Abu. As a mountaineer, we used to be taught uh, skills like rappelling and doing the, you know, uh, uh, Burma Bridge, and uh, we used to be getting into a lot of uh, activities, and these activities were uh, at times uh, to build our aerobic strength, at times to build our anaerobic strength. Uh, obstacle courses and everything used to be done. So maybe coming up a chimney or, or, or rappling down and stuff like that. Now, this is Mount Abu and, you know, coming down and moving up. We used to do activities which were timed. We used to be into drills that were timed. And gradually, we used to get better at these timings. However, there was another course. The course was known as the confidence course. This was not timed. And at the you know, uh, confidence course, the obstacles could never be successfully navigated if you were alone. Being alone was always an essential uh, sign of failure. We could not have done it alone. We had to have people around. We had to have you know, created trust around us for people to really, uh, you know, uh, depend on us. So initially we were trying to prove ourselves at the best. Initially we wanted to outdo others. Initially we were very competitive. But gradually, as the week or the weeks went by, something else happened. We started caring for each other. We started realizing and we organically started helping each other. We started realizing if I need to survive, if I need to move up, I need people around me. At times there were people uh, uh, you know, who would not want to help others. And there were people who were pretty, uh, you know, uh, you know tough, uh, uh, stiff upper lip, and they would not want to uh, seek help. They would not want to ask help from others. And virtually, uh, always uh, in, a, in a corner, you know, what used to happen with these people? Automatically, they were ostracized until they learned how to help and how to ask for help. This is all about vulnerability and risk. It's all about building trust in each other. When we go from being you know, cool to awesome, are we building a chain, a network of trust around? Awesomeness is when you look out for each other. Awesomeness is, you know, uh, before you set out to help others, awesomeness would mean, are you confident of doing things your own way? Are you confident of helping people? Are you confident of the knowledge that you have within you? And that is what would happen. And that's the picture of uh, something which is known as the Australian rappelling. Some of you might have done uh, adventure courses, some of you might have done mountaineering courses, some of you in JCS would be doing a lot of, uh, you know, these uh, uh, outbound uh, training programs. Now, we see rappelling and rappelling is something very, uh, very basic. You just come down a rock, you hang down, and there is a belay, people holding the, uh, you know, a, a rope. This is the Australian rappelling. You don't come down uh, with your back to the ground. You come down, head down, 90 degrees, trying to go down. 
when you come down 90 degrees, you know, you see the guy holding the rope with both the hands. He's being held back by somebody. He's being held back by somebody. If that person or this guy, they were to release the grip, this guy is surely going to fall to his death. Even if this is just 15 or 20 feet high, losing even a bit of your grip, loosening your grip uh, even by half a degree would mean certain death. And this is what happens when we get trained. This is what happens while we were getting trained. And trust me, they would not let us get onto this obstacle course. They would not let us get onto this uh, Australian uh, raffling until they have seen everyone demonstrate building a lot of trust around in the group. They would not let this course take place. We use this now in our outbound programs and trust me, this has become something which has led people to have a greater vision, to have something where it is absolutely impossible not to trust you. This is what we do. This is uh, a picture of, of something that we do in the forests of Dangs. Uh, it's, it's a wildlife sanctuary. Here, people are trying to look out for each other. Of course, uh, since it's, it's a corporate group that we always take in, uh, safety is paramount to all of us and we would have to build in some uh, you know, checks and measures. But uh, nonetheless, here also, despite the rock just being about 15, 20 feet high, the risks are almost uh, as high as we used to face when we were in a mountain range. Do we look out for each other? Do we look out for family, friends, and organizations? Do we look out for people around us? And this is where one thing comes into play and that thing is accountability. Are we accountable for our actions? Integrity, what do we really do when things uh, you know, are not visible to people? How do we really move ahead with integrity and accountability? I'd like to share with you uh, somebody I know very well, uh, a guy who left his home state. This guy is from, uh, no, he's a rock star, absolutely, a biker. He's a photographer. He left his home state of uh, Rajasthan uh, many years back. And uh, this guy is taken in, into uh, helping and saving animals. Uh, his love for animals has seen him go from you know, one place to another. He would see animal being crushed and he would pick pick up that animal, try to save its life or do things, uh, you know, maybe bury the animal and, and, and uh, many of these things would keep happening. So this guy, a very, very handsome bloke, uh, somebody who is uh, very, uh, you know, cool and awesome in today's parlance, somebody we all, uh, you know, uh, would love to be friend and get photographed uh, next to, an avid photographer. You know, when it comes to uh, being awesome, he's my uh, number two go-to guy after Rocky. This is the guy, his name is uh, Aditya. He lives in my city and uh, he is uh, an animal rescuer. So call him anytime, he would come on his, uh, you know, a bike, a nice 350cc bike. He would come with a huge cage behind his bike and would do whatever it takes to save the animal that's been injured or left around, maybe, you know, a, a, heard through somebody's uh, mischief. This is a guy who would give up everything to save an animal. Now, uh, we might have a lot of people like this around us and some of you might also be something uh, similar to this guy. So why am I uh, trying to uh, show this uh, case study to you? Aditya, folks, Aditya is not a normal uh, boy next door. He lives like a normal boy next door. He's not a normal boy next door. He's a guy who's suffering from cancer. And uh, some time back, the cancer that he had jumped from stage two to stage four. The cancer jumping from stage two to stage four. This guy staying alone, no source of income because he could not continue working. He continued saving animals. On a rescue mission, he met with a near fatal accident, bike lost his life barely hanging by the thread. Somebody put him, because he was rescuing an animal, it was outside of the city. Somebody put him into the hospital. He was brought back to Baroda. Took many months to recover. Back to the same task, saving animals. Goes back home. Somebody says, I've got fish. And these fish are going to be, uh, you know, 
very soon they're going to be uh, killed because I don't have a means to uh, save them. I've got to move out. He did not have any other means except uh, create an aquarium. He creates a huge aquarium in his home, an aquarium that cost him a lack of rupees and all his savings. This guy is not spending money on his own uh, you know, treatment. He gives it to all his uh, kids, the animals that he calls them kids. He considered a huge aquarium, a cost of a lack of rupees, while going from one room to the other. He banged the aquarium. I don't know what might have happened. The aquarium broke. The aquarium broke. Massive gash on his body. He falls down, injures his neck, is almost paraplegic. Almost paralyzed neck down. And what happens next? Again, uh, you know, uh, rehabilitation. Again, getting back, again, getting up, again, trying to recover slowly. He does the job, comes back up. No bike, not a good health, not being able to lift animals. He would lift a, a calf. He would lift uh, small, uh, you know, uh, uh, goats. He would lift uh, even pigs and then carry them on his bike. He still does the same. Now we've seen the uh, entire lockdown scenario happening. This guy having no money, uh, not asking anyone for money. This guy being confined to the, uh, you know, closed uh, doors of his home, approaches the police, says, uh, lockdown or not, animals need help. Give me, uh, you know, give me the approval for, for me to go out and talk to people. You know what he does now for the whole day, he rescues people, uh, you know, uh, animals, keeps them in his home. He's taken a flat far away from the city. He keeps them in his home, comes home uh, every morning, cooks for them. At the end of the day, he has got a couple of, uh, you know, 100 kgs of rice cooked. In the evening, he's venturing out again, trying to feed these stray animals. A boy, not being able to live in his home, away from home, away from warmth of parents. A guy having no means of income. Whatever he does, he does it with a bit of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cyber security, uh, just to make money, uh, enough money that, that he can live by. A guy who's suffering from stage four cancer does not know whether tomorrow he's going to be around or not, still keeps trudging on. These are the kind of people who have got what we say, integrity of the highest order. Nobody's going to question him, why don't you uh, rescue this animal? Nobody's going to ask him, why didn't you come when I called you? He has a very legit reason not to do so, but this guy would say no for no one. And after this rock star, uh, you know, uh, meet another rock star, a drummer par excellence, a drummer from New York, a drummer who has been coached by the best drummers in the world. A drummer, when he drums, uh, bands from various parts of India, maybe US, they would come together. This guy, I'm, I'm talking of, uh, you know, what does it mean to have uh, high accountability? What does it mean to really contribute big time? When he used to drum, people used to listen. And then he realized my drumming is a form of therapy for people. He started something called the drum circles. Cutting the long story short, he was, uh, so this guy, his name is Paulum Mystery, my senior from school, an Indian a rock star uh, in New York, uh, doing drum circles as therapy. Paulum wanted to come back to India. I said, Paulum, why don't you come back and let's initiate something called drum circles for the corporates here. We initiated the drum circles. We put up an organization called the Drum Sutra. We were doing you know, one or two workshops and all of a sudden, uh, I had to go to the UK and uh, we had a presentation to happen. We had a very, very massive uh, initiative taken by the HR community of Gujarat and uh, some celebrities were to come and they said, your drum circle is going to be doing the opening round. Can you do it for us? We said, why not? And so it was decided, uh, my company, we would be doing the drum circle right up in the beginning. I was in UK, Paul and the team were to be doing the drum circle. While I was doing my workshop in London, I get a call and that was from Paulum's brother. He says, uh, Imadri, I've got a news for you. I said, what? He says, Paulum has been struck with a heart attack. And that, that simply blew me away. Not because we had work coming up, it was because he was one of the most genuine people around. He was such a close friend. I never wanted anything to happen to him. Not because, uh, again, uh, you know, he's somebody who's supporting me or I'm supporting him. He is one of the most wonderful human beings in the world. 
and his brother says he must be he's had a heart attack and it took me a while to gather myself i called up the organizers and i i, I communicate to them uh, you know gentlemen this thing is not going to happen all of us had a heart attack and i don't think we can make it but behind my back uh, you know there was some of the question coming in we are people who commit to somebody they are committed people are coming in as as a trainer we don't have something to show to you know our audience and that is a medical certificate so i had no medical certificate to show and then uh, i decided let me come back to india i came back to india on the day when i was supposed to be leading my team i am no drum circle coach but then i knew something i said fine i'll come and lead my team into uh, the drum circle i come around 6:30 is when the time is about you know the, the show is about to happen 5:30 i'm at the venue and when i'm at the venue you know who i see inside the hall i see this guy there's this uh, hr and convention i see this guy he is right there holding his drum says well man let's take it away let's have a massively brilliant drum circle for people let's give them a reason to enjoy and we did give them a reason to enjoy unfortunately that was the day when i had my last drum circle with paulum sometime after that he was drumming he was doing his bit with a band of his bands from across the country when he was you know young student those bands from that day they were coming together there was a reunion while playing his drums he had a massive heart attack and paulum passed away i lost somebody who was so very close to me but then today when we all remember paulum it is only for one thing the purpose that he lived for the reason that he was alive and that was only it, it, it's very simple he always used to say imagine if people are happy uh, around me if people are happy doing what they do why not give them a reason to celebrate themselves and this is where we we we, we see somebody uh, somebody saying something no sir i'm muting okay this is where we see somebody you know who is close to a lot of people around i'm i'm skipping the next one but then we see somebody who is close to all of us uh, a lot of us here could be uh, personally acquainted or we would know this person who is always into ensuring that his presence becomes a reason for people to celebrate the late bharat shah a terrific human being a great friend of friends somebody who always used to ensure your life becomes better due to his presence he always used to exhort each of us a great friend of mine as well a former able coach we lost him while he was in able some time back in salem bharat shah the late bharat shah a giant of a human being a giant a towering personality always used to tell me one thing you know he had everything whatever money could buy he had that whatever fame could get he had that he was always very humble very soft spoken uh, never used to take offense to anything and always used to tell me he must be if there is an opportunity for me to help you let me know i'll i'll try and do my best you know he was also in the other part of his uh, uh, career and his business is he was also known as the bni king but so many of the people in india in jci india in the jc fraternity a lot of us oh our success as you know i'm not a part of bni but so many of uh, you know our friends they have been executive directors and they are doing so very well it's partially and not partially it's fully because uh, bharat bhai introduced them them to the, this beautiful opportunity bharat bhai a great great example of somebody who used to say either i be dis distinct or i make way for somebody else and uh, you know you can see is a very uh, a lovely wife uh, meena ma'am right next to him he never used to move alone he always used to have uh, you know meena babi uh, right next to him and uh, you know i i i was contemplating you know uh, awesomeness also leads us to do one more thing uh, we do play we do things and uh, do we always play to win not always many times we always uh, you know have this concept of uh, how victory would look like but many times we also given to that uh, you know a notion of let's play not to lose it's okay let's play not to lose well awesome folks always play to win they never miss uh, lose sight of the mission uh, in the us uh, you know there is uh, one of the most popular uh, military schools a school that trains that is the best in the world that's the best in america and this is the uh, 
West Point uh, uh, U.S. Military Academy. This is at the West Point, and anyone who is anyone wanting to get into the army would want to get here. So I mentioned something about the people who are awesome, people who really make a big difference. I mentioned that these people have uh, a side of the goals. They know the mission. They know the price, and they pay the price. Uh, I'm married to a Malayali. My wife's cousin, uh, you know, she is uh, she stays in the U.S. Came back to India for a couple of years. She's got two kids. Uh, Vishnu and Kannan. They were studying in India. They were in Bangalore. And uh, my brother-in-law, he again got uh, a job in the U.S. and went back to uh, California. So I was at their home and uh, the elder son, uh, Vishnu, he was uh, probably in class 10. When I asked him, uh, what is it that you're going to be doing next? He said, well, uh, I've got everything sorted out. I said, what? He said, I'm going to get into the U.S. Army. I said, how? You and U.S. Army? That guy is shorter than me. Uh, he said, well, I've got everything uh, sorted out. I've got the plans made. I have got a mission. I'm going to get into the U.S. Army and I'm going to get into West Point. I said, what is that? Because that was new to me. He said, West Point is the academy to get into in America if you want to get into the army. I said, uh, buddy, how are you going to do it? You are an Indian. Of course, you were born in the U.S. or so you're an American citizen. Uh, you want to get into the army because you want to serve your country. This the country that gave you, uh, you know, everything that you have today. I, I understand your loyalty. I understand your uh, approach. But how are you going to get yourself into the most amazing, the preeminent leadership development organization the, the American uh, army has? He says, I know how to get into it. For the last five years, I've been preparing. Uh, his parents were not aware of that, uh, that, you know, this guy can't really get there or not, but they always supported him. Uh, he said, I've been preparing. I've been uh, reading things about West Point. I've been doing some interviews. I've been talking to uh, officers, army officers. This guy was all in class 10 and he was ready to get into West Point. But that was then. I had my work to be uh, taken care of in the U.S. Uh, I, I keep going there, coming back. Uh, that was then. I was at his home, uh, did my bit, and uh, I came back. And last year, we got news. News. Uh, what was so uh, astonishing, Vishnu was the youngest Indian. Vishnu is the youngest guy from uh, anyone from our family, the youngest guy in our family. Vishnu is possibly also one of the youngest Americans to get admission into West Point. Today, he's cadet at the West Point Academy. When he graduates in 2023, he will be second lieutenant. This guy, shorter than me. This guy with a great mission, never lost track of what he needs to do. And this is one reason he's always, always going to really, you know, succeed. Uh, I'm going to skip to some, you know, something which, which you might all be aware of. And that is, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, we have just a few more minutes to go. Uh, can you tell me, uh, you know, uh, who are these people? The chat box, if you can write. Do you know this couple? Anyone? No? All right. Uh, that's Major General Jagdar Singh Khan and his wife Kamaljit Khan. Not Chatwal from US, no. I just give the name. Uh, that's, that's Major Khan, Major General Khan, retired Major General Khan and his wife Kamaljit Khan. Why do I present these two people to you? Why do I present these two people to you? Uh, Kamal Jit Kang, when, when she was 22 years uh, old, she was married and uh, 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 at, at the age of 22, she was pregnant. One night she had a dream. A saint, a saint opened the holy, uh, you know, sick holy book. Uh, in her dream, the saint said, name your baby a son, Dusht Daman. Dusht Daman is, uh, you know, uh, it means destroyer of demons. The saint said, you need to name your son Dusht Daman. Now, Kamalji, the mother, she was thinking, such a hard name for a child. Uh, I don't want to name my child Dusht Daman. The saint was right. Uh, you know, after a few months, a boy was born. For eight months, he went without a name. He went without a name. And finally, Kamaljit and her husband, uh, they went to a nearby saint to uh, seek another name. A name that was not so rough, a name that was smooth, a name that was a little more modern in its appeal. 
and uh, the name given to them was something which which sounded uh, you know pretty pretty cool to them it said uh, this guy uh, this child of yours is a person who does brave deeds the name karam beer a person who does brave deeds so the name was given and uh, the child moved on child grew up the child went on to do great jobs went on to work in some industries went on to uh, uh, create some uh, history can you tell me what happened on this day can you tell me what happened on this day absolutely you got it that was the day when our uh, democracy was attacked uh, you know attacked uh, from some of the you know most uh, uh, most difficult and uh, thoroughbred terrorists that was the the attack that took away 167 lives of these 167 lives 31 people were killed uh during the four day siege from 26 to 28 29 31 people they were killed uh at the taj mahal hotel in mumbai and how many of them were staffers people who used to work at the taj half of them half of them were staffers and then people thought you know th there was there was a lot of uh, uh questioning that that kept happening that what does it take for people to give up their lives why would people at the reception counter man the counter and not allow the terrorists to go beyond why would people in the front office operations create a human shield and sacrifice themselves to save people and foreign guests why would they do it they did it because they had a history they did it because they were trained to do so they did it because there's somebody who's who's trained them to do so not just somebody an entire institution had trained them to do so karambir singh kamaljit's son was then the general manager of the taj mahal hotel his family was on the sixth floor in the same hotel his wife and two boys they were killed that day they were they were burnt they died of the fire and kamal you know karambir singh khan's mother kamaljit says i wish i had not given him the name karam beer i wish i had given him the name as kamal uh, as the destroyer of demons dusht daman possibly he might have killed a you know terrorist that day when the attack happened karam beer was not at his hotel he was at, he was on the taj mahal he was at taj lands end he quickly drove from taj lands end bandrat all the way to uh, you know taj mahal hotel he did talk to his wife they were very worried he called up his father he was in the gulf his father said my son be a brave sick his father said be a brave sick uh, he was in bahrain you are an army general son stay afloat with your ship or go down and stayed afloat did he yes he did somebody says that this has been the tata legacy it has been the tata legacy that if you start something you you know you 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 keep building trust and people first is the policy well people first was tata's policy but look at the tata selection they used to select people who always used to put others first karambir is a guy who lost his wife lost his two kids and continued serving till the time the hotel was sanitized terrorists were removed that's a recent photograph uh, karambir khan in uh, you know uh, uh, uk us uh, so this guy is now running the entire taj operations in the us this is something that brings me to uh, my last bit and that is the culture the ecosystem we see the taj culture we see you know major general khan's culture telling the son not to abandon the ship and uh, culture you know it's it's very easy to put culture as uh, something that we see here that's the uh, source of uh, the holy river ganga gangotri and from uh, gangotri the ganga flows 
and uh, the Ganga flows down. So symbolically, if I am an individual, for example, I'm a family guy, I am the head of the family, or I run an organization, what am I? I am the Gangotri. What emanates from me, my values, what emanates from me as a mountaineer that I just, you know, shared the example, uh, what Rakhi does is all a part of an imbibed culture. People who are awesome, they do not go by something very new. They have something that is deeply imbibed in them. Gangotri is the source and Ganga is where the culture flows. So if you see a good culture flowing, you would see fields and farms on both sides of the river Ganga, absolutely, you know, lush green. If the culture is not so okay, you would also find that Ganga needs a Safaya Bian. You'd also find Ganga is not so clean. And this is what we need to understand, that the culture of caring for people around. We've seen a lot of relationship training, uh, something very, very amazing. I just thought, you know, people who made a difference in my life, people who have been absolutely awesome, people who have been rock stars in my life, they've all been the people uh, who, who have been practicing this, uh, you know, uh, philosophy uh, of, of experiencing uh, uh, the, 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 the protocol called TLC. TLC, what does TLC mean to people? TLC is something very simple. TLC to, uh, uh, to me, TLC is tender loving care. Do we have that for people around? Do we give that to people all around? Uh, sometime back we had the, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, absolutely uh, superb, uh, uh, you know, a leader for all of us, uh, somebody who has been, uh, uh, an icon for all of us, uh, the great Ratan Tata. He was uh, in Baroda trying, you know, he was receiving an award, the Sahaja Ratna Award. And while he was receiving the award, he had come from the France, uh, you know, a, a conference uh, of, of nations, uh, which was into uh, climate change. He had a 16 hour tough flight, uh, you know, schedule. He was not well, came to Mumbai, from Mumbai directly flew down to Baroda and he was thrust into our, you know, our organization where the award was to be held, the ceremony was to be held. There was nobody, uh, no chaperone, nobody to, uh, no, no aid to look into uh, his comforts or his needs. He was all alone, standing. And then we had a small reception. My wife, Sarita, a JC, she's a part of the executive committee there of the organization. And uh, we had the privilege of having a personal audience with him. This guy, 16 hours of travel, not doing very well had nobody to support him, nobody to offer him a glass of water, standing on the porch of uh, the, the uh, Hotel Taj in Baroda. We all queued up to meet up with him. He's not rushing in, he's not just, you know, trying to give a nice, uh, you know, fake kind of a smile. He is standing, he's standing with a lot of uh, dignity. He's standing with a lot of love for the person around. That's Ratan Tata receiving us, talking to me, talking to my wife, he held her hand for almost five minutes, we were into a conversation and the Rasan Tata, trust me folks, it was not that we were just talking shop. He, he inquired about us, he inquired about the work we do, he inquired about the business that we are in and said, well, uh, you know, the work that you do is something that I would like to see for my own organization as well. The work that you do, I'm sure you'd be able to help my organization become better. That was the kind of love, that was the kind of, you know, a, a humility this man had with him. He said, uh, I'd, I'd love to see you in my company someday. There were other things that also happened. Uh, I don't have the time for that. And TLC very recently uh, was shared with me. I've shared this with some of my audience, uh, you know, in the junior chamber, sharing with some, some of you might not have uh, seen this. Uh, you know, sometime back, I had the privilege of uh, being invited uh, and uh, being the guest at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. I was at the Rashtrapati Bhavan as the guest of the President of India for three days and three nights and uh, there was work to be done. There was uh, some work, uh, I'm not at the liberty uh, to share, but there was work to be done and I was doing it. Day one when we reached, I thought, uh, you know, I'm going to be here only for an hour. And that was uh, how I had uh, prepared myself. I had nothing with me, no additional set of clothes. I was uh, doing my bit and the President uh, somehow liked the entire uh, a presentation that the uh, you know, delegation took to them. He said, stay with us and for the next three days, you are going to be here. 
we're going to be having the Padma award ceremony and everything and uh, stick around and uh, stick around with it. Uh, we, we were, you know, uh, required to go get some, get some new clothes for ourselves. So uh, there was a breakfast with the president of India and his family. There was lunch with the president of India and his family. A lot, many things uh, transpired, uh, beautiful interactions with the prime minister of India and a lot of those uh, uh, Padma awardees, the Padma Bhushan, you know, MS Dhoni and all. Uh, that was uh, the other part. And that's not what I'm here to discuss. Uh, that's not what I'd like to uh, share. What I'd like to share with you is something very, very, uh, very basic. Uh, we were having our, uh, you know, meals. Uh, we were having our lunch. Uh, that's uh, uh, me at the president's uh, dining table where he hosts uh, heads of nations. We had the privilege to uh, be, be a part of the gathering there. And uh, something uh, very beautiful happened. Something very amazing happened. Uh, almost about 10, 15 minutes into our, uh, our lunch, I think that was day two, if I'm not wrong, uh, I, saw, I saw something uh, move. So we were having uh, you know, regular Indian uh, food, dal, chawal, roti, sabji, and stuff. And uh, the president's uh, right hand moved. The gentleman between me and the president is Mr. Krishna Kumar Agarwal from Kanpur, uh, a, a philanthropist, uh, a close friend of the president, and a very, you know, a, a thoroughly uh, beautiful human being. The president's hand moved out. Uh, he was uh, using the uh, cutlery. I, uh, his hand moved out, and uh, it went into the uh, plate of uh, Agarwal's. Uh, and then he beckons his uh, team. He says, uh, in Hindi, uh, he says, Agrawal sahab ki roti thandi ho gai hai, zara badal denge. Which meant, Agrawal sahab's roti, there was roti on his plate. He says, gentlemen, can you replace the roti? Can you get him a fresh, warm roti, please? India's, you know, the, the, the first citizen of India doing that to somebody, absolutely unthinkable. The first citizen of India thinking so deep about somebody's you know comfort thinking so much about ensuring that my guest needs to be taken care of first that he ventures from his circle of love and sends that circle of love all around and that is what the sense of you know purpose living for tomorrow Iki guy is all about trying to move in and do things that are right trying to live for a higher purpose and i learned a lot of things that day with my you know, in my interactions with the president. And uh, this was the highlight of uh, my entire career so far that uh, I don't need to uh, know great language. I don't need to have, uh, you know, uh, something which is very jargonistic to be used with my people, my participants. I don't need any of these things. What I need is do I end up, you know, from uh, b being a part of the Homo sapiens sapiens, the species, the uh, human being, can I? you know, shift myself from human being to being human. And that was TLC. Uh, folks, uh, uh, just about time I had, uh, but before I call it off, uh, you know, I was doing a webinar some time back and at that webinar, I shared with people uh, that these are unprecedented times. And, uh, you know, coronavirus and stuff like that, these are unprecedented times. From that day till today, I have had my own uh, understanding. I've had my own unlearning, or rather, you can say relearning. These are not unprecedented times. Uh, as a country, yes. Uh, in terms of it expands, the, the kind of impact is it has had across the country, sure. But then, do not, you know, uh, uh, don't, don't we see all of us being thrust into shocks and jerks every now and then? The video store that was once a video store has now given in a way to you know live streaming what we do right now. The the a coffee shop right next door has given way to a Starbucks or a CCD. We have all seen emergencies. What is it that you know this becomes so tough? Is this really unprecedented? People who have invested in the internet mindsets will be the one who are going to be coming out from the you know uh, times of tomorrow. Uh, you know unprecedented possibly because. Uh, uh, we have not even saved enough to last her for three months. We have not saved enough uh, that, you know, when, when uh, some data comes out, it says that uh, if airlines don't resume operations by the end of June, most of the airlines are going to be absolutely out of business. So the point is we have had, 
instances in the past. We have seen challenges happening in the past. It's not that this has not happened. We need to get up and get going. We need to get up and then do a bit of, you know, questioning things back. Uh, you know, people always feel that uh, if things change, I'll be doing better. If things become better, uh, you know, tomorrow onwards, if the lockdown improves, the lockdown shifts, I'm going to be back in life. But then this is the time in which we understand, is it really a lockdown or is it uh, time for all of us to do a rethink? You know, last time I, I realized uh, this, this bit that TLC that I just shared, uh, some of you might have been born in 97 or after 97. Uh, 97 was the last time I applied for a job and applied for an interview with the proper CV. After that, I have had lots of jobs. And uh, it's not that I, I did not apply in uh, other jobs, but that was the last time I actually formally applied for a job with the CV. After that period, each of my job has happened through the network of people around me. Each of that has happened with the connections that, that kept coming around and helped me move above ground. Can we make that happen now? Can we train our mental muscle through practice? Uh, you know, uh, can we go back and decide that I'll never be broke again? Can we be like what, you know, uh, the underground sales in Nike are happening today, which is uh, absolutely an awesome thing. Uh, Nike, the second and Nike uh, sales, which is all in the underground, it beats the number two competitor of Nike. And that's how the uh, Nike secondhand sales are, can be evolved. Unprecedented, no. Unprecedented uh, ever in the past, no. Can we come back and take stock of things? It, it needs an infinite mindset. So can we make that happen? And this is what uh, I just thought uh, things can uh, give a smallish kickstart. Uh, I've got a cousin who has a restaurant in New York, uh, Jackson Heights, uh, uh, one of the most popular Indian joints, which is frequented by people like Harrison Ford and Bill Gates and you know uh, a lot of these uh, 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 presidents of the US. Now, what are they going to be doing? I'm not too sure, but then I'm sure that from being a fine line restaurant, they're going to get into something which will be very, very amazing. And this is what we've already talked. Uh, they, might, they might want to shift, uh, uh, you know, track from being a fine dine to being the most safe delivery uh, based uh, restaurant. They would want to create some new protocols and packaging and safe handling. It's time for all of us to go back and rethink. So this is uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for now, let, let's do some bit of uh, doing a bit of digging deep inside us, doing a bit of uh, understanding, uh, uh, doing a bit of rethinking, and maybe uh, we need to uh, invest in ourselves once again the way we are doing. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. National President, for this opportunity. I'm sorry the video is hung here at my end. I'm unable to get back the video. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, National Director Training, and thanks a lot, uh, uh, Wamanji, for being such a wonderful moderator. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I wish uh, 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 some of our friends uh, in the uh, Hindi speaking belt, of course, I've already had the conversation with them, and uh, we are doing a Hindi program later on. So I had that conversation twice or thrice in the last couple of days. Uh, I was requested, can you do in Hindi? I said, we'll do in Hindi again. So for all the folks, uh, who still are there and would want a Hindi? Well, uh, let, let's uh, uh, let, let's look at things uh, in, in the coming period. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah, Himadri, thank you very much. Uh, if you please uh, stop sharing your screen, you can come to. Yeah, right. Sorry, uh, the video is not happening. I don't know why.